Hello. I want to talk to you today about an evaluation that we carried out of Speak Out, Stay Safe, which is a large-scale educational programme about abuse. And this work is a collaboration between the University of Greenwich, the University of Central Lancashire, Edinburgh University and Queen's University Belfast. Now, research tells us that a significant number of people experience abuse um, during childhood. And the Crime Survey for England and Wales estimated that around one in five adults had experienced child abuse. And we know from extensive literature that experiencing abuse and violence during childhood can have a very negative effect on children and young people. The majority of education programmes in this area tend to focus on one type of abuse or harm um, and there's very little evidence that has examined the effects of programmes that focus on a variety of different harms. And it's also important that we take into account um, contextual factors and individual difference factors when we're looking at the effectiveness of some of these programmes because it's possible that interventions can have different effects for different children in different settings. Now Speak Out Stay Safe is a large-scale programme designed by the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children or the NSPCC and this programme is designed for primary school aged children who are between the ages of 5 and 11 years in the UK. And Speak Out, Stay Safe addresses a broad spectrum of abuse. So it looks at bullying, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, neglect and domestic abuse. And the aim behind this programme is to help children to recognise the different forms of abuse and to be able to identify trusted adults and aid with their help seeking. Speak Out, Stay Safe is delivered in schools and it's delivered by NSPCC staff and trained volunteers. With younger children, there's an assembly and with older children, they receive an assembly followed by a workshop. Our evaluation aimed to examine whether Speak Out, Stay, stay, stay Safe improved children's understanding of abuse whether it aided their help seeking, and we looked at this in terms of their readiness to tell, their ability to identify an appropriate trusted adult, um, an increase in their knowledge of the Childline number, um, and Childline is a free helpline for children, and enhancing their confidence in seeking help should they need it. And in this evaluation, we compared children who'd received the programme along with those who'd not, and we looked at long-term retention of the messaging. So this is part of a larger scale evaluation study that we carried out. So we did look at younger children, we looked at um, programme delivery, and we also looked at cost and benefit of the programme. But today I'm just going to focus on um, our work with nine and ten year olds. So we recruited around 1700 children aged nine and ten from schools in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We recruited about 955 children um, from schools who were going to receive the programme and 746 children were recruited from comparison schools who had no plans to receive the intervention for at least six months. We recruited a diverse sample of schools in terms of their location, in terms of um, the number of children eligible for free school meals, in terms of their faith, and in terms of whether they were conducting any further fundraising for the NSPCC. Um, we put together a battery of measures which were um, given to children on tablets using um, online software and we looked at children's knowledge of abuse so we looked at children's ability to identify different forms of abuse as something that might happen to children. We also used the children's knowledge of abuse questionnaire by Tati 
and that ex includes items such as if a grown-up tells you to do something you always have to do it. We also looked at help seeking so we developed a bespoke measure designed to elicit children's help seeking and this is an example from the bespoke measure so we ask the ch well we tell the children your friend's parents tell him that he's useless and a waste of space this makes him feel very upset what should he do and um, the children have a number of options so nothing tell someone about it don't know why well, don't want to answer this question um, if children select tell someone about it it then um, gives them the options that they can choose We also looked at children's knowledge of the child line number and how to find it. And we further measured school climate using the authoritative school climate survey by Cornell. We administered these, uh, this battery of measures three times, um, pre and post intervention, and then a six month follow up. So if we look at the results in terms of what children know already, um, this table shows their baseline knowledge of abuse, so their answer to is this a type of abuse that happens to some children. And what you can see here is that around 78 to 79% of children felt that bullying was a type of abuse that happened to some children. Um, but when you look at sexual abuse, this drops to 55 to 56% of children. And neglect, this is even lower with only around 30% of children identifying this as a type of abuse that happens to some children. So you can see that there's a variety in terms of children's responses here, that children are much more likely to identify bullying as a type of abuse, um, but much less likely to identify neglect. When we look at help seeking, we found that the majority of children were, were aware that they should seek help. A minority didn't, and some actually chose other children or friends rather than a trusted adult to confide in. Around 50% of children knew the child line number, and a slightly more knew how to find the child line number. When we look at the immediate impact of Speak Out, Stay Safe, um, this is the children in the intervention programme at their pre and post um, assessment. What we find when we're looking at whether they can identify different forms of abuse, we find that there's a significant increase in the number of children able to identify neglect. Um, similarly, an increase in children able to identify sexual abuse, emotional abuse and physical abuse. But as you can see, there was so no significant change in the proportions of children being able to identify bullying as a type of abuse. And that may well be because of the high levels um, at the beginning in baseline. When we also look um, post-intervention, we find that children's knowledge of abuse questionnaire scores significantly increased, showing an increase in the ability to identify abuse. There was a significant increase in their readiness to tell and a significant increase in their ability to identify a trusted adult. There was no significant um, change in them feeling able to confide in a trusted adult, but there was a significant increase in being able to identify and locate the child line number. If we look at the results over six months, looking for sustained impact, um, this is a comparison of children in the intervention schools, pre-intervention and at the six-month follow-up. What we find is that children are significantly better at identifying different forms of abuse at um, six-month follow-up. And their um, children's knowledge of abuse questionnaire scores demonstrate a significant increase in ability to identify abuse. There was no significant difference in readiness to tell, but there was a significant increase um, in a six-month follow-up in being able to identify an adult, a trusted adult to tell. 
there is no significant difference between pre-intervention and six-month follow-up in feeling able to confide should they need to, but there was a significant increase in being able to identify the child line number at follow-up. If we compare um, children in the intervention schools and comparison schools at six-month follow-up, there was a significant um, difference between the two groups um, with children in the intervention schools um, scoring higher in being able to identify the different forms of abuse. There was no significant difference in the children's knowledge of abuse questionnaire or in terms of their readiness to tell. However, children in the intervention school um, were more likely to identify an adult to tell. There was no significant difference between the two groups in feeling able to confide, should they need to, but there was a significant difference in being able to identify the child line number, with children in the intervention schools um, more likely to be able to do so. We looked as well at moderating effects and we looked at the school climate and what we found was that children in schools with a more supportive school climate demonstrated more improvement in terms of their readiness to tell, their ability to identify a trusted adult and in feeling able to confide in a trusted adult, although there were no significant differences um, in their understanding of the different forms of abuse or in the children's knowledge of abuse questionnaire. We also found that girls were significantly more likely to be able to identify and locate the child line number when they were compared with boys. So in summary, um, in terms of the sustained impact of Speak Out, Stay Safe for Children, we found that there were some significant improvements made by children in the intervention schools straight after the delivery of Speak Out, Stay Safe stay safe and these were retained in the longer term at six month follow-up. In terms of help seeking, children in the intervention schools sustained their improved ability to identify a trusted adult and their improved ability to recognise and locate the child line number. When we look at knowledge and understanding of abuse, children in the intervention schools showed significant improvements in their ability to recognise the different forms of abuse and harm at follow-up, and this was particularly the case for neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse and emotional abuse. Um, as I already mentioned, there was no significant change for bullying, probably because the children were quite high at baseline. So in conclusion, what we find is that an integrated program addressing a variety of different forms of abuse and harm, as Speak Out Say, Stay Safe does, can achieve some sustained impact for children. And while most children in primary schools show some good understanding of abuse and harm and show some readiness to seek help, there is a small minority who don't. And universally delivered programmes such as Speak Out, Stay Safe can reach this group and boost their knowledge. We also found that school culture is important. Interventions therefore should acknowledge and engage with the school context in order to really embed the messaging of the programme and to work with schools and with teachers in the continuation of this messaging. We feel that further research could also examine the appropriate length or dosage of prevention programmes delivered to primary school children. And future research should also examine whether targeting prevention programmes at specific groups of children may be beneficial. I'd like to thank you for listening um, and I would also like to thank the children and the teachers who took part in our research and also acknowledge the um, funding from our funders. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Luke Roberts. I'm CEO of Resolve Consultants and today I'm gonna to be talking about sustaining anti-bullying interventions in schools, the myth of the whole school approach and complex adaptive systems. 
a little bit about me. So I used to work in local authority um, and I used to set up anti-bullying initiatives in schools. Um, and I also helped um, build networks of school practitioners within um, my local authorities in England, as well as also building a pan-London network of local authorities to promote restorative um, approaches in the early noughties. I was also um, chair of the Back on Track Workstream, which was a funded programme to look at implementing restorative approaches in five local authorities um, in pupil referral units across London. And how do you actually implement um, restorative approaches to create change in those settings? Bear in mind, pupil referral units are places where children who've been excluded from mainstream education often end up with the hope of returning them back into school. Through my work, I was also asked to train Met Police officers um, on how to be more empathetic using restorative approaches to address issues of bullying and conflict as well. And then more recently, my work has involved working with prisons and secure children settings to look at how to address issues around bullying, conflict and violence. So my positionality was someone who was both a, a practitioner someone interested in the strategic understanding of how change occurs. And then more recently thinking through, well, what's the evidence base? And also how do we use evidence to apply models of implementation around bullying was where I was coming from at the time. So from my perspective, conflict is a natural part of life. All young people will experience and adults will experience conflict at some points in their life. And in, the reason why I was particularly attracted to restorative approaches, because this felt like a relationship orientated way of addressing conflict and ensuring that people had their emotions recognised, as well as how do we turn conflict from something that can be quite harmful into something positive. Whereas I always make the distinction between conflict and bullying because although there may be peer-to-peer -peer violence in conflict and bullying, the definition is something that I think most people would recognise as relating to the work of Avelis and Peter Smith, as well as David Farrington as well in the UK, um, which is about recognising that bullying is a repetitive, intentional, aggressive and harmful behaviour by perpetrators, which creates an imbalance of power between individuals or groups who are the targets in real or online spaces. And I think it's really important to recognise that that repetition isn't repetition of the same type of behaviour. So a young person may put something in a WhatsApp group um, that's quite harmful and then followed by pushing that person or group of people in school and then spreading rumours. So it's the, the repetition is in the harm that is created, not just repetition in the same type of behaviour. And also importantly for me, it's about recognising that the language of targets is more child-centric than all in children victims. I think that's really important. I think that's one of the ways in which the anti-bullying field can really contribute to having child-centred approaches to anti-bullying interventions. So the definition is really important because sometimes people say to me in educational, educational settings, well, bullying is subjective. The experience of bullying may be subjective, um, but the definition has to be, I, I believe, strongly objective because then it's about recognising that even if a child doesn't see the dynamic as fitting in with the criteria of bullying, that actually as professionals, we do. So from our perspective, it's really important to recognise that this objective definition is something that will help us understand um, whole school or potentially whole school change. So when we look at bullying, it's really important to say that within the English context, bullying in terms of permanent exclusions, that is children who are excluded from school and do not return to school, remains at around kind of between 40 and 45 incidences um, per year. However, when we're looking at fixed term exclusions, we're suddenly into the thousands. So this goes up to 2018, 2019 before the pandemic struck. Um, but what we can see here is, is that children who are fixed term excluded for up to 45 days in one in any one exclusion period, um, we're close to you know the 4,000 mark, if not the 4,500 that's happening in schools. But bullying is one of the 
the many reasons why children be, are excluded from schools. So when we look at the main causes of exclusion for permanent exclusions, this is around persistent disruptive behavior. So not enabling the teacher to be able to teach a class, followed closely by physical assaults against another pupil and then physical assaults against staff. So again, we can see that, you know, although we're in the thousands, there's a looks like there's a steady increase in trend around excluding children, particularly for persistent disruptive behavior. Whereas when we look at fixed term exclusions, again, for these three things, there is, we're now into the tens of thousands. So children being fixed term excluded um, for persistent disruptive behavior. Again, you know, in 2018, 2019, we were at 137,000 plus um, exclusions. Um, so again, this says that the, the way in which children are excluded for particular types of behaviour within the English setting is really important to recognise how punitive this setting is. And this is something that the anti-bullying um, field needs to recognise, that the setting for schools is often punitive. And when you think about it from a societal perspective, um, you know, it was in 1965 that um, England got rid of the death penalty and then you know almost 20 years later we stopped hitting children in schools through um, physical punishment so the key point here is that often anti-bullying initiatives are not in a benign environment they can often be seen as countercultural because the dominant system feature is punitive so when we have something like restorative approaches as a form of anti-bullying intervention. It is a counter-cultural idea um, because it's not adhering to the, the norms of the punitive system. So from my perspective, although restorative approaches is a contested um, idea, I see, tend to see it as very much a process-driven approach where you have an impartial facilitator engaged in delivery structured dialogue to address bullying and conflict situations. And importantly, attempting to reach a peaceful resolution. Often restorative approaches is set up as an idea that will not only address the conflict and bullying situation, but also um, reduce exclusions. And I think the risk in that is that schools can have both punitive and restorative interventions at the same time. So it's important to say, well, actually, restorative approaches as an anti-bullying initiative is something that is not just there to potentially uh, address exclusions but actually are we creating peaceful resolutions so young people can coexist peacefully in their school and that there's an important reason why that is and I'll come back to it so from my perspective a lot of the restorative lit literature and the anti-bullying literature tended to talk about school change so from a analysis of the literature four types of school change came out for me so firstly the myth of the hero innovator Secondly, pockets of practice or niches. Thirdly, whole organisational change. And then fourthly, ecosystems. And this is where I think um, a lot of my own practice and research now resides. So the myth of the hero innovator is basically where there's the assumption that you can train an individual person and that individual person can go back and change the organisation. And there may have been a time when that was appropriate, but now we're in a place where schools are too large for individuals to be able to make any significant difference simply by going on a training course. I think that's fair to say. So the second type of school change, and this came out from the work of Skins et al, um, 2009, was very much about pockets of practice when looking at restorative approaches. And so a group of educationists are trained and they deliver that restorative intervention in, in response to, for example, conflict and bullying situations. Often they are placed within a, a specific area of the school or alternatively, their practice may be place based, i.e. when we need to have a restorative meeting, we will use a classroom or you know, a therapeutic room. But that has to fit within the wider context of the school. So there's a real risk that that particular group of um, practitioners can sustain themselves for a long time. However, there's also a high risk of burnout. So when we think about the whole school approach, which is the dominant change model, the reason why this is often cited is because it has a, a criteria. So using some um, government guidance from 2014, which I felt really captured some of the key aspects 
of the whole school approach was, you know, do you get leadership buy-in first of all? Is there a policy that will state how the school is going to use this anti-bullying initiative? Is there opportunities to use it within the curriculum? Does it affect the school ethos or culture of the, the school in a particular way? So it's the way in which staff and children interact. Um, to what extent is student voice part of um, the whole school approach? Um, and then importantly, what is the provision of support services? How do children who are being targets or potential perpetrators access support services? Um, and then usually there's an aspect that's around parental involvement or wider partnership. So from the restorative approaches field, it becomes quite clear that a lot of evaluations tend to talk about the use of the whole school approach. So the Youth Justice Board evaluation of 2005 is still probably the largest. Um, and then Wong et al. 2010 was the most specific that wanted to identify a whole school restorative approach. But what we can say is that came off of the back of all of these um, pieces of research was that the whole school approach was a minority of schools that tended to do it. So probably one in four across these research um, documents were actually able to achieve the whole school approach with schools tending to do other things like partial implementation or no implementation. So there's a real risk that we advocate for the whole school approach. And yet when you look at it through the literature, it's not that common. It's not the thing that most schools achieve. And one of the reasons for this is because what tends to happen is that most anti-bullying initiatives from my own research tended to last about three years. And that's probably the life cycle of um, the research um, funding. And so what tends to happen at that point is either the school stops doing that anti-bullying initiative or adapts it in some way. But bearing in mind that we have this punitive default position, so there's a real risk that, that in that adaption we take the anti-bullying initiative and we start to then use it in a punitive way. So when we're thinking about an alternative to the whole school approach, I'm very interested in complex adaptive systems, which have the features of feedback, self-organization, emergence, system boundaries, and boundaries in social systems can be perceived as well as real, the relativity of time, and also the way in which these things interplay. So those, that criteria tends to offer a different lens by which we can look at and understand organisational change. So where is the feedback in the system around the anti-bullying initiative? How does the initiative self-organise? What are the emergent properties that allow the school to do something different? What are the boundaries that regulate or constrain the, the initiative? And then in terms of time, we're looking at much longer scales than three years. So what does it look like in five years time? What does it look like in 10 years time? So the reality is that over time, systems will interact and adapt. And so for restorative approaches, from my own research, what became really apparent was that it was being used not as an anti-bullying initiative, but as a teacher and pupil initiative, mostly for return to class. The second aspect was that the punitive system had co-opted some of the language of restorative approaches. So we talked about needs of children, but then what do you need to do to return to class, for example, which wasn't what restorative approaches was designed to do. And then also importantly, how the use of this anti-bullying initiative could actually be a coercive form of control because it was returning back to the, the default system's behavior in terms of, although we had the, the veneer or the icing going back to my metaphor of the whole school of approach as a cake, the veneer of restorative approaches, but actually the structure still remained punitive. So from our perspective, why I'm arguing that there's the myth of the whole school approach is because bullying is in a market economy and therefore it remains periphery to the core business of schools. And so th therefore without you know, sources of funding and the ways in which schools can continue to sustain that funding post an intervention period um, or research period, it's unlikely to be anything more than a per periphery idea um, rather than a whole school initiative. And um, the growth of alternative provision and off-rolling in England schools suggests that where schools can, they will outsource this idea. Um, there's a real risk that researchers and charities is too short term to contribute to long term systems change and actually may contribute to change fatigue where people go, oh, here's another initiative. Um, and ultimately, there's a question about when we're thinking about the whole school approach as a myth, 
what we need to do is say that we know that it has a life cycle of about three years and is it successful for one in four schools. So where does the research field look for sustainability and what's the paradigm shift that needs to happen? And this is my argument why we need to think in much more complex systems to be able to say that if we want to create long term change within the educational system, we need to stop seeing it as a veneer and, or as an icing that's put, put in place. But how do we ensure that there is systems change? Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Hello, my name is Rachel Maunder. I'm from the University of Northampton in England and I'm here um, with my colleague Professor Claire Munts um, from the University of Greenwich to talk about the work that we've been doing on um, care relate, care, caring friendships in primary schools and how we've been seeking to prevent peer relationships difficulties. Um, I'm on the left hand side on the picture there um, and Claire is on the right hand side. Um, it's me that's going to be talking you through this today um, but I think Claire is also in, in this same parallel session so you'll also hear from her shortly too. So we're interested in the um, overlap between peer relationships and bullying. Um, the evidence does suggest that there are blurred boundaries between bullying and the wider peer relationship context. Certainly, if we look at the research on this, um, the kind of status that children have in the peer group, the extent to which they are liked by their peers um, and the friendships they have, this all seems to contribute to their experience of bullying and, and whether that increases or, or decreases their vulnerability to being bullied. Also, we know that there is a fluidity in roles. So it's not the case that children are either a bully or a victim and, and those those relationships stay static. Children often move between these roles, depending on the situation, depending on the context. Um, and that does suggest that there is a wider kind of peer ecology that bullying forms part of. We also know that children's the level of children's social emotional skills, so how well they're able to form relationships and sustain relationships with others, um, impacts on their risk of bullying involvement. So this in, again indicates that bullying is part of the wider relational dynamics that children are part of. And therefore, I think Blatchford have uh, um, talked about the sort of classroom ecology and how we need to think more broadly about the complex interactions and relationships within the classroom setting when thinking about bullying that occurs and um, how it can be viewed and positioned. Thinking about friendship, um, friendship also um, intersects with bullying in particular. Um, for example, children's um, the friendships that children have um, is linked to bullying behaviours. So children tend to be friends with other children who, who have a similar level of engagement in bullying. Um, children who also who are friends with children who bully others are more likely to engage in bullying behaviour. So there's that influence effect too. We also know that children experience bullying within friendships. So rather than friendships and bullies being completely separate, it is often the case that children report that those bullying them are perceived friends. And that can be really confusing for children and maybe less likely to be identified as a bullying experience because they don't, you know, because it's their friend, they don't think that it's bullying. But having friends seems to protect children from bullying. So when children have established friendships, they're less likely to experience bullying. So there's that kind of buffer. Bolmer talked about it as the friendship protection hypothesis. And similarly, the friendships that children have impacts on bystander responses in bullying. So when we look at what children do and how they make decisions as to whether they're going to intervene or not when they see a bullying incident happen, um, their relationship to the children involved um, will impact on that. So they're more likely to intervene in episodes where they're friends with the um, child on the receiving end. They're more likely to intervene if they like the child that's being bullied and less likely to intervene, perhaps if it's their friend doing the bullying or, their, or, or it's not a child that they have a kind of personal connection with. Um, we also know that friendship more generally is good for children. It helps them um, with their kind of well-being, their psychosocial adjustment. They get on better at school. Um, they're engaged better with school. So having friendships is, a, is an important part of children's um, school experience. And having friendships help children, helps children to cope with bullying better. They seem to be um, protected from some of the um, negative effects of bullying um, and they have uh, better well-being for those that are bullied compared to children that don't have friends. 
But it's not just having friends that's important. It's the quality of the friendships. Um, in, related, in work that um, Claire and I have done, um, we found that, um, first of all, reciprocated relationships was really important. So children who identify each other as being close friends um, impacted on the quality of the relationship and also um, the extent to which um, it impacts on children's feelings of self-worth. Um, and when we're talking about quality relationships, we're talking about the extent to which the friendship has the features of good, you know, of, of a good relationship, such as, you know, how much companionship it has, how much support um, and help they give to each other, what sort of level of trust they have, all those things that we'd associate with um, a good, a good relationship. Also, the quality of friendship um, seems to impact on this level of protection about bullying. So it's not just having friends protect you. It does depend on the nature of that friendship. Um, similarly, the nature of the quality of the friendship is important for that um, for that effect on on how well children cope with bullying as well. So what we see here is that friendship and bullying are interconnected. And a key aspect of that is the skills and qualities that children have in their relationships with others. The indication would be that if children have good quality relationship skills and they're able to form meaningful friendships, they're able to sustain those friendships, nurture them and deal with conflicts in friendships when they occur, they're going to be not only in a, in a much better position um, in terms of their engagement and enjoyment and well-being, but also they're less likely to be engaged in bullying. And if they do experience bullying, they're more likely to cope with it effectively. So the relationship skills is therefore something that we really want to attend to when we're thinking about preventing difficulties um, within friendships and also preventing bullying. Now, in England, we have um, two uh, statutory government documents relating to bullying and friendships, which are particularly relevant to mention at this point. Um, in uh, We have a um, mandate for schools on the left-hand side to prevent and tackle bullying. So this is a policy about making sure that schools have um, you know, pro pro detailed strategies in place to prevent bullying from occurring and to manage bullying effectively when it occurs. Um, and also on the right hand side, we have some recently implemented statutory guidance for schools um, for um, implementing relationships, education, relationships and sex education. And this uh, requirement for, um, I guess another word for it would be PSHE or kind of personal social and health education, this, this requirement for it to be um, all children to have this all, all through at primary and secondary level is, is new. And the um, guidance is quite detailed on the different topics that are expected to be covered um, by schools at both primary and secondary level. And the emphasis on this relationships education is very much on helping to equip children with the skills um, and abilities to be able to make informed decisions about their, themselves and, and, the, and their relationships and recognise um, healthy and unhealthy relationships and take appropriate actions. So this seemed particularly relevant to um, our interest in bullying and friendships. And particularly if you hone in here on the topic areas that school primary schools are expected to cover as part of the new relationships and sex education uh, curriculum. Um, there's two particular elements that, that, are, that are relevant to our interest in bullying and friendships. You'll see here there is a, a specific unit on caring friendships. And also within the respectful relationships topic, um, bullying is specifically mentioned. Um, so, you know, there is, um, it, it, bullying and friendships form a key part in what schools need to be talking about with children. However, there are some challenges for schools in actually implementing some of this um, relationships, relationships education. Um, alongside the fact that this um, statutory requirement has been introduced uh, at, at a time that's coincided with um, the COVID pandemic and, and all the disruption that that's had for, for, for schools. Um, we also know from, from research on um, teachers um, personal social experiences with personal social and health education that they do have some challenges around for example not feeling prepared to to teach on these kinds of topics um, th th being able to teach um, uh, you know social and emotional skills and, and PSHE is not a core part of our teacher training it's a, our teacher training is a very packed curriculum there's a lot to cover and although there may be mention of it it's not something that um, maybe uh, is covered in, in the amount of detail that enables um, 
training teachers and then kind of newly qualified teachers to feel really competent and confident in dealing with those topics. Also, when there, um, when a, a new curriculum is introduced with um, topics on there that may not have been uh, covered by schools before, there's going to be time and planning needed um, for um, education professionals to prepare for those things. Um, and this is time that we know that, that schools and, and um, teachers and so on are very short of. They need to ensure that the materials they develop are um, appropriately appropriate for the for the age of the children. Um, there's also, although there are a lot of materials available for teachers and, and other professionals to to use and download from the web and so on, it can be difficult to sort of know what the quality of those materials are and to what extent they've been tried and tested and, and we know that they're kind of appropriate and being developed with any kind of rigour. Similarly, we know that teachers and other, other professionals delivering the, these kinds of um, topics in the class can worry and feel ill-equipped to deal with questions that might get asked because, you know, a lot of these are, are quite sensitive topics um, and people may have personal experiences, quite, quite difficult experiences that make these topics very personally relevant. In the um, guidance to um, schools about implementing relationships education, there is some recommended approaches as to how they do this. And it's emphasised that, you know, um, educators need appropriate pre preparation and training. Um, boundaries need to be set so that t uh, children feel safe um, discussing sensitive issues, know exactly what the ground rules are and so on. Um, they also recommend distancing techniques so that there's a way in which these topics can be discussed without people feeling the need to share personal experiences. Um, so they're almost discussed in a kind of a safe way. Um, and of course, they need to be inclusive to accommodate children with various different um, special needs and also coming from uh, different backgrounds and experiences. And the recommendation, of course, is also is that these um, topics and, and, and issues are dealt with in an interactive way, allowing lots of opportunities for children to work in groups to explore and debate um, the issues raised. Now, this presented an opportunity to us because we've obviously been doing some work on on, on children's friendships and um, with the implementation of the new statutory guidance to schools where caring friendships is a particular um, unit um, that, that schools are having to teach. Um, we felt um, that um, we, we could offer some support to teachers um, and, and other educators based on our research findings. So we have developed a package of resources um, that will support primary schools, and particularly primary schools at Key Stage 2, which is um, in England is age 7 to 11, um, to um, implement the Caring Friendships Unit of the Relationships Curriculum. Um, we are um, planning to expand that to cover the other topics such as bullying and so on, but we're starting with the caring friendships because we see that as being quite foundational for the basis of the other relationships that are expected to be covered um, as part of the curriculum. And the way that we've done this is we've used illustrated stories that feature different friendship scenarios um, that children can relate to. So we're using a fictional class, which is class 6V at Bankwell Primary School. Um, and each story focuses in on a particular character and a friendship challenge that they're experiencing. Um, we have um, the stories are designed to be engaging. We've got lots of lovely photographs, pictures, images um, to accompany the stories. Um, and then there is an associated lesson plan that educators can use to help children engage with um, and explore the issues raised in those stories. We're currently piloting a small set of the materials to see if the format and structure that we've adopted is going to be appropriate for educators to use. So the way that we've done this um, is we have developed um, a number of stories that map onto the requirements of the Caring Friendships Unit of the Relationships Curriculum. So on the left hand side here, you will see um, the, um, the specific guidance that's, uh, of what schools have to cover under this unit. Um, and on the right hand side, we have our, our main characters um, in the first set of stories that we've developed. Um, and each of the stories will enable schools to address um, the, the, the different issues being raised here. Um, and um, we're, we're focusing on one of the stories to start us off um, so that we can get some feedback as to whether what we're doing is going to sort of meet the needs of schools. So just to give you a bit more insight into some of the characters, um, we have um, the idea is that children will get to know the characters in 6v they'll get to recognize the children in the class who crop up across different stories 
um, and take on different roles at different times. We have Mr. Vadar, who is the class teacher of 6V, and he pops up in all the different stories. We have Alex, our narrator, who is a member of Class V, who um, sort of tells the story on behalf of the children that are involved. And we have OP the Owl, who is a key part of uh, Bankwell Primary School. He is their talking owl, who um, appears um, at appropriate moments um, uh, when he is aware that uh, children are having difficulties with their friendship and he recognises that, that they are sad or need help, he will come down onto the bench in the playground and he will ask the children questions um, and help them to think through um, the difficulties they're facing so that they know how to deal with it. The first story as part of a pilot is featuring Tommy and Stefan and Tommy and Stefan have been best friends for, for a long time in their childhood. But as they're getting older um, in, in year six, so year six is the final year of primary school where, where class 6V is based, um, they're noticing that their friendship is changing and they're perhaps starting to um, not be as close as they were and they're each finding that quite difficult to handle. So the story kind of goes through each of their perspectives on this um, and um, as part of the activities following the session, the children will need to explore how they would advise Tommy and Stefan to deal with that situation. So you can see here, um, just to give you an idea of what, what is included in our pilot pack of materials that we're currently um, sampling. So we have um, the, the pilot pack covers uh, enough for two sessions for educators. In the first session, they're introduced to 6V as, as, as the class, the focus of, of the story. Um, the first session is about um, setting ground rules and kind of getting the children ready for the topics that are going to be discussed. Um, and in session two, um, first of all, they will look at the story of, of Tommy and Stefan um, and, and then they will move on to um, a structured lesson plan with a series of activities that help the children to um, think about how they would um, you know, deal with the issues raised and what, what advice they would give to the characters. And we also provide some additional resources to educators to help them prepare for the sessions and um, how to kind of prepare themselves for, for what might happen in the session. So as part of our pilot phase, we are engaging with three different groups. Um, for educational professionals, we are um, seeking feedback for, from people. So uh, we're asking educators to um, review the materials and provide feedback on their suitability and content. Um, we're also um, involving educators in actually trying the materials in a, in a, in a session with the children that they work with and giving us feedback into how, the, how those sessions went. And uh, we're planning to conduct some interviews with teachers as well to get a more detailed insight into their response to, to the materials. We also want to engage with children, so we're planning to do pre and post measures for children who are going to be participating in one of the pilot sessions. We're going to be measuring their friendship expectations before and after to see how, um, you know, having the, 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 the dedicated sessions on friendship will help them maybe shift their, their friendship expectations. And we also want to have some focus groups with children about their response to the materials and what they thought of them. Um, we also are engaging with parents because a key part of the relationships education um, in England is that parents have an active role and, and schools are required to involve parents and, and, and consult with them um, about um, the way they're um, implementing the curriculum and get feedback. So we are involving parents in, in looking at the materials and seeking their feedback onto their, as to their um, views on the appropriateness of those materials. Clearly, because of the COVID pandemic, our progress has been um, less uh, speedy as we were hoping. Um, we have had um, we have run a number of events where we've had um, educators um, and other professionals um, hearing about the resources and downloading them. Um, and we have we had got some class based um, activities lined up where we were going to actually go into schools and um, do the uh, sort of class based survey. But um, the the ongoing disruption has caused problems and kids had to isolate and, and so on. So we haven't been able to collect any data from children yet, but we have plans this academic year, providing everything stays a bit more stable and schools stay open. Um, we have everything ready to go and it's just a case of, um, of making those, those links with schools and going into it to get some feedback. If you're interested in, in having a look at our work and, and having a, a look at the materials, you can visit our website and, and you can also download the materials if you want. Um, the link is here. Um, and also um, I've got the references here for the presentation um, and I've put the details of um, our, myself and Claire's contact details and our Twitter handlers. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we're very keen to, we, we do post what we're doing on Twitter, uh, keen to engage with others who might be interested in our work. Um, and I thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions you might have in the, in the Q&A session.